It violated our rights and we couldn't move where we want to. And we go march till hell freezes over. The result of racism can be found in the housing policies across the U.S., which led to the 200-day marches in Milwaukee. This debate in grassroots diplomacy by Milwaukee's youth in the 1960s impacted the city, state, and country. The NAACP Youth Council led the diplomatic planning in fierce debate. Their diplomatic steps included taking the issue to the streets, which can still be seen in America today. In 1963, an advertisement paid for by the Milwaukee Board of Realtors was posted in the Milwaukee Journal, stating, quote, Today, the rights and freedoms of an individual American property owner are being eroded. This endangers the rights and freedoms of all Americans. It is self-evident that the erosion of these freedoms will destroy the free, enterprising, individual American, end quote. This ad referred to the open housing movement, which started to take shape in the 1960s. The reasoning for this open housing movement is evident in the information released to the middle and upper class white Americans during this time. The debate began to take shape when realtors and bankers claimed in advertisements while working with white homeowners that economic downfall loomed ahead if an African American moved into their neighborhood. Some white Catholic priests in Milwaukee were against open housing as well. Father Russell Witten described open housing as not open, but forced. He and the majority of the white community saw this debate as a violation of the Constitution. The debate was freedom to choose over basic civil rights. If an individual is approached by some individual, regardless of color, race or creed, they ought to have the right to refuse if they so desire. As many white Americans didn't have the access to resources that would reveal both perspectives, they relied on realtors for information on buying and selling. These realtors would then guide them on the path that would benefit themselves. In 1866, a Civil Rights Act was passed, stating that, quote, citizens of every race and color shall have the same right in every state and territory in the United States to inherit, purchase, lease, sell, hold, and convey real and personal property. However, 100 years later, political loopholes and the moral beliefs of the white majority created racially biased housing policies, triggering housing discrimination protests in Milwaukee. Just before Christmas in 1966, a Vietnam veteran named Ronald Britton tried to rent a duplex for his family near 29th and Burleigh. The white landlord refused, saying, what would the neighbors think? The soldier's homecoming portrayed in the famous Norman Rockwell painting was a far cry to the homecoming Mr. Britton received. In need of house for his family, he turned to the NAACP Youth Council for help. This organization was a vital part of leadership within the Milwaukee Civil Rights Movement. Formed in 1947, the Youth Council embraced Father Grappi, a local priest, as their strategic ally. As it fought for justice, the NAACP Youth Council grew to be an organization embodying young people from all over Milwaukee, coming together to fight for equality. Realtors made the claim that property values would drop when African Americans moved into a neighborhood. Just the opposite came true. Data shows property rates rose two or three times its appraised value when sold to African Americans. They paid too much for their housing and were forbidden to move out of the central core. A national report in 1965 affirmed that 98% of Milwaukee's black residents lived in the central core. This is a result of intentional government action. The declining of mortgages, white flight, and propaganda used by realtors all played a part in the discriminatory housing crisis in Milwaukee. Intending to pressure the city's common council, the youth council picketed the houses of multiple aldermen, which fell on deaf ears. Another critical voice, Val Phillips, led the charge in the legislative portion of this movement. As the first woman and first African American elected onto the Milwaukee Common Council, Phillips introduced an open housing ordinance in 1962 that would cover the majority of properties in Milwaukee. The ordinance was overthrown 18 to 1. Phillips, the sole black council member, cast the only vote in favor of fair housing. 
She debated this ordinance three more times in the span of five years, each time resulting in an 18 to 1 outcome. It is my firm intention to submit this ordinance for reconsideration as soon as the rules of this council will allow. Later, Belle Phillips joined forces with the Youth Council and eventually became an honorary member. On August 23, 1967, Grappi and the Youth Council announced their next diplomatic move, marching to the South Side. The Youth Council began marching on August 28, 1967, as the march made its way down the 16th Street Viaduct, also known as the Mason-Dixon Line of Milwaukee. 8,000 counter-protesters met them in an attempt to reduce the uproar beforehand. The NAACP Youth Council informed white residents of the South Side they were marching, but the route was kept confidential. The peaceful protesters chanted and sang, but were met with violence, some even taking bricks to the head, many going home that night beaten and bloodied. This did not deter them. The Youth Council met nightly, debating strategy for the next day's march. Although it is now known as the 200-day march, a timeline had not been set. Each meeting was diplomatically held. Grappi left the final decisions up to the young people. The choice of allowing young people to lead this movement offered new debate tactics and a diplomatic mindset. Are we going to die for our freedom? Yeah! The intentions of these marches were to cast discrimination in a public spotlight. And to achieve this, the Youth Council marched every night with the intention of visibility. Many Youth Council members' greatest debate, however, was within their families. After losing her mother at the age of three, Pamela Jo Sargent was raised by her grandmother, who saw firsthand the effects of violent, racist attacks in Arkansas. She, she tried to stop me from going, but I used to climb out the window and run up the... I lived on 6th and Clark, and St. Boniface was on 11th and Clark. And so I would go up to my room like I was going and do my homework and climb out the window and go up to the march. The preachings of Father Grappi used the Bible to teach concepts such as justice, nonviolent disobedience, and redemptive suffering to the council. Difficult debates came from outside their meetings, and it took diplomatic steps from the youth in order for them to arrive at the march at all. Eventually, the debate on whether to march or not was won by the youth, in the end, older generations marched alongside their children. They were protesting about the fact that they were black Americans and they were not receiving their rights as black Americans. They were not only uh, studying history, they were making history, you see. And this was doing something psychologically to every black child that participated in that demonstration. He was telling the world and he was telling himself that not everything is right in America. April 4th. 1968. Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated. April 5th, 1968. Cities all over the country break out in riots. With the Youth Council's leadership, Milwaukee marched peacefully. More than 15,000 people took to the streets, making it one of the biggest memorial protests in the nation. The arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. The 200-day marches are an example of the time it takes to create change and the diplomacy it takes to make that change. Within this movement and era, two legacies arose. The legacy of the diplomatic mission of youth marchers is seen today through the student protests of social justice issues. The legacy of housing discrimination, however, can still be seen through the segregation in Milwaukee today. Banks and realty companies were sued on the claims of redlining and discrimination. The impact that the Milwaukee NAACP Youth Council had on America is inescapable. This was the starting point for a fair housing ordinance passed in Milwaukee on December 12, 1967, four months before the Federal Fair Housing Act was passed on April 11, 1968. The legacy of the marches have never been as prominent as they are today. An activists group in Milwaukee, known as the People's Revolution, marched for 200 days straight protesting the George Floyd shooting. This protest tactic was based solely on the marches of 1967 to 68. The 200 day marches, a diplomatic and peaceful movement, are a piece in the arc of the moral universe. And this arc continues to bend towards justice today.
Corinne, that was a terrific film. Thank you so much. Like uh, Lachlan and Aubrey, you live fairly close to the geographical location of your documentary. I'm curious, had you heard about the open housing movement in Milwaukee before this, or how did, how did you come to this topic? Yeah, I actually had not ever heard of the Milwaukee open housing movement until uh, two years ago, so a year before I started this project, um, when I interviewed Dr. Robert Smith from Marquette University. And he is one of the um, main, he's like the face of um, March on Milwaukee, a digital archive and civil rights um, project about the uh, NAACP Youth Council and their march. And so I interviewed him for my uh, documentary two years ago for National History Day. Um, and from there, I went to one of his forums about March on Milwaukee and was just encaptured by the NAACP Youth Council and the movement in Milwaukee. I mean, would you say it's important if you're going to do a documentary like this that you feel some sort of personal connection to it, that you have like personal enthusiasm for the topic? Yes, absolutely. That is one of the main things that I think is important in National History Day because it would be a whole different experience if I had to uh, stick with a project for almost a year and had no personal connection. So I, um, I am really passionate about social justice and um, I think it is super important just because of um, all the things that are going on today and the parallels that you can see in, from history and um, it, like especially the the March on Milwaukee. Um, so the, that um, that connection and my passion for the social justice issues was a big part of me choosing to do this project. Yeah, you certainly did an excellent job of connecting this event from the mid 1960s with things that are going on today. Uh, I'm really curious about the sources of, uh, you know, footage. You have a lot of archival footage, a lot of archival footage in your documentary. And, uh, you know, including some like really striking color footage of uh, with some pr uh, pretty uh, repulsive uh, racist imagery uh, in it as well. It's a very powerful uh, moment uh, in, in your doc. Uh, so I'm curious, uh, where did you find that footage? Yeah, a lot of it was from the digital archives in the UW, within UWM. They came out with a digital archive featuring uh, primary sources, um, footage, you know, all that kind of stuff from the marches themselves. And that was one of the biggest um, places that I got all of my primary sources. Um, but it also presented a little bit of a challenge for me just because I had this huge influx of uh, primary sources and information. It made it even harder uh, to, you know, get down to the soul of the project because I just had all of this information. So how did you decide then to, to, to find where the soul of the project was? Did you, did you write a script, an iterative process? How did this, you know, work itself out over time? Yeah, it was something I struggled with up until uh, my final draft. I wasn't happy with my documentary for both regional and state. I knew that it was missing the, the main like soul of the piece. Um, and I think it was a lot of late nights <laughs> um, to find the what I really wanted to include. But I think how I ultimately um, found the soul of the piece, um, like you know, through research um, and through writing a script, I I stuck to um, what can make an, an emotional impact on the audience. You know, it follows a story. It's not just a bunch of facts in a line. You know. That that's not going to make the biggest impact. So I stuck to what I really what I thought the audience um, would be the most engaged. Was there anything surprising that you found in your research that you just kind of weren't expecting to see? Yeah. So this is super specific to my topic, but uh, I was expecting um, for this these marches to be 
um, super, I don't know how to explain it, um, but these marchers to be the main source of the movement in Milwaukee. And what I found was that although these marchers and Father Grappi um, were the face of the movement, there was so many other things going on behind the scenes. You know, so there was Val Phillips who was leading the legislative portion of this, this civil rights movement. And there was, uh, there were so many little jobs within this movement that I was, I didn't even expect. Uh, I thought it was very impressive how you kept coming back to people like Father Grappi and Val Phillips uh, as, uh, you know, people who were real leaders uh, in this movement. But what I was most struck by was the sheer number of young people uh, involved in this. Uh, and that had to have some resonance with you as a documentarian. Yeah, that was my main goal for the documentary was um, I had I kind of had a choice. I could focus on uh, Father Grappi and his impact or the, the youth. And I chose to go with the youth because I thought it was the impact that they made was so powerful. And as a young person myself, it resonated so strongly um, making the documentary. So you explicitly tie the open housing movement in Milwaukee to the George Floyd protest of 2020. Uh, was that your intention when you entered into the documentary or did that just sort of evolve? Yeah, it's hard to say. I think after studying and researching the, the marches on Milwaukee, it was, it just came super clear to me that it was a parallel in history. Like, um, I think it was Mark Twain that said, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And that is the quote that just, I could think of over and over in my head when I was uh, researching and making this documentary, um, because it's so true that these, these George Floyd protests um, of 2020 were almost identical to the 200 day marches in Milwaukee. Yeah. Uh, and that seems to be a theme that's running out through a lot of documentaries uh, in this program. It's very true. Uh, I also really enjoyed your numerous musical cues uh, in the doc, uh, but even uh, to the point of uh, adding in a little bit of church organ, uh, I think, when you introduce Father Grappi. Uh, but I also saw that you have a, a credit for the original score. So can you talk... Talk a little bit about your music in your documentary. Yeah, so uh, I am very musical um, in addition to making documentaries. And I thought that um, in addition to, uh, you know, writing the script, I thought it would be even more personal if I uh, wrote the music for the documentary. And so I uh, sat down on this piano um, many many nights and um it was my way of of attaching um you know some of me to that documentary and showing how i interpreted the the documentary itself and the story that i was telling um yeah and uh, making the music for it was so powerful to me just because i could interpret the the story through music any way that i wanted um in addition to into writing it down. So what was the most fun part of making this documentary? Um, I think the I had the most fun doing this documentary uh, when you would get to a part um, where you something just clicked, you know, you were you added some footage and your uh, your music worked and your script lined up and it was so exciting to have that moment that just it was like whoa this really works and then you know you would get your family to come in and watch um and that was I, those were some of my favorite parts making this documentary corinne thank you so much and congratulations on your award thank you